So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, 2021 edition of the State of the Union organized by the European uh, University Institute in Florence, uh, uh, and in particular to our fringe event on the EU-Africa Digital Partnership in a Changing World. Uh, my name is Andrea Castagna, and I'm a member of the European Digital Development Alliance, an European association which represents think tanks, civil societies, and individual experts and focusing on digital policies for uh, digital cooperation and development. I would like to introduce you to the speaker of this fringe event. We have uh, uh, Susanna Zlatkova, policy leader and fellow at the uh, School of Transnational Governance of the European University Institute, who is also giving us very shortly a short introduction of the topic of this panel. We have also Dorothy Gordon, um, who is the chair of the UNESCO Information for All program and board member of the UNESCO Institute uh, for uh, Information Technologies. Um, we also have Onika Magwagwa, head uh, of uh, Africa sector of Alliance for Affordable Internet and the World Web Wide uh, Foundation. And last but not least, we have Bjorn Richter, head of digital development program for GIZ. So thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, just a quick technical remark. Uh, our panel will be a Q&A session in which I will be asked each of you uh, a question. I please ask you to stick uh, on the time so we don't go too long because I know that uh, the State of the Union this year has a very dense and interesting digital program. And I'm also asking the audience of this uh, panel uh, to tweet about this session by using the hashtag uh, SOU2021. So thank you everyone for joining us. And I'm giving now the floor to uh, Susanna to introduce the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. So let's start with digital transformation that is happening now and everywhere. And in the past year, it was accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. It is an essential instrument to enable sustainable development and inclusive growth. But it is also a relatively new part of the EU's foreign policy. From Council conclusions on mainstreaming digitalization into development cooperation in 2016, we have now digital transformation as a key priority for the Global Europe instrument. Digital transformation embedded into key documents of the EU, such as Gender Action Plan 3 or the EU Africa Strategy, with Digital for Development Hub created last December as a multi-stakeholder forum. Many challenges, but also opportunities are still to be addressed. Today, we will discuss specific areas on which the EU and Africa is willing to cooperate and exchange best practices while learning from each other. We start with digital challenges. So what is feasible to achieve and what capacities African countries need to have for the digital transformation? Second part is about options for a creation of genuine partnership. And at the end, we brainstorm on the conditions of leaving no one behind in the digital transformation. So now I give back floor to you, Andrea, to lead us throughout the meeting. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. So maybe let's start, as I say, from digital transformation, which is happening now and everywhere. And it's a topic that has also been accelerated by the COVID-19, and it's a crucial for Africa and the European Union partnership. So I have my first question for Dorothy. So uh, Dorothy Gordon, what is feasible to achieve and what capacity African countries have to prepare for digital transformation according to your opinion and professional experience? I would say that um, we are uniquely placed in Africa because we don't have so many legacy systems to actually catch up extremely fast when it comes to digitalization. However, there are a number of challenges when it comes to capacities. So first of all, let me say very clearly that Africa is very concerned that it does not slip into a further dependency mode. It does not want to be simply a consumer of technologies. It also wants to be able to produce the technologies that it uses um, to strengthen its institutions, to strengthen its outreach to the most vulnerable. And if we're going to do that, I think that there's a huge overhaul 
that we need to put in place of our educational systems. Uh, first of all, in higher education, and I would say in general, policy seems to think in terms of digital means computer science. But when we talk about digital transformation, we recognize this is totally cross-sectoral. So we need to have that kind of review of our higher education, even as we are looking at what we are doing in basic education, in secondary education, and particularly in the area of media and information literacy for the entire population. And I will end just by stressing that at the moment, we see far too much emphasis on key communication around digitalization that is only in the legacy colonial languages. Um, we need to make sure that we put this in the languages that are used by the bulk of the population and which they can understand. We also need to put a lot of attention on building up our businesses. And so far, we see a lot of emphasis on startups. But once you've ended your startup phase and you're actually trying to grow your business to a level that you can start competing, it's very difficult to get resources. In the interest of time, I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dorothy. I think like you touched uh, some key areas uh, that uh, maybe we can explore a bit longer in the panel. I have now a question for Bjorn because Susanna was mentioning the recent development between the EU and African partners, namely Global Europe, EU Africa, uh, Euro EU and the African Union Digital Economy Task Force, D for the Hub. So my question for you is, to what extent can the EU and member states help Africa to address digital development challenges according to your opinion? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> uh, maybe building upon what uh, Dorothy said, um, uh, it's 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 a it's in it's an innovative new approach for both continents. And um, what we saw in December when uh, uh, Miss uh, Miss uh, von der Leyen uh, and also the uh, also the German Chancellor uh, launched the D4D Hub was that this was a joint launch by civil society, by uh, tech companies, and also by Smart Africa as one of the digital inno innovative uh, 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 yeah actors on the African soil. So this is a joint endeavor. Um, so I believe we cannot um, the, uh, support or help somebody, but we actually are in a real cooperation when it comes to digital uh, for development. Um, um, now that uh, D4D Hub uh, is, uh, it, uh, is, a, is an important tool to facilitate cooperation with member states, um, their development cooperation, their uh, foreign office cooperation, their, um, their economic cooperation, but also uh, with uh, startups, uh, Dorothy mentioned, uh, with um, uh, uh, African digital ministries uh, and obviously uh, what we call the ecosystem in the different countries and also on Pan-African level. So for us, uh, coming from uh, the European side, uh, the D4D Hub should serve the human-centric digital development model. We know that there are other models being implemented um, but we believe that is what uh, Europe can bring to the um, sovereignty, uh, the digital sovereignty to, to Africa. It's learning um, from uh, what we did uh, in, in Europe in the last couple of years. Now, concretely speaking, um, we, we see that um, projects are implemented. Yeah. For example, the SOMAS project uh, in West Africa is, implement, is impl implementing since last year already a pandemic uh, monitoring system that is now being rolled out to the IGAD region, to East Africa. And this pandemic uh, system is also covering a COVID model. So we are actually working with digital on COVID. And interestingly enough, uh, this model, um, developed uh, on African soil is now being implemented in, in Germany um, in the uh, health uh, centers. Um, that really shows us that we are on eye level. Yeah. We are also, uh, uh, together with the European Union, implementing a digital learning platform uh, called Yoma, where startups and young people can learn uh, through learning nuggets and can really implement this uh, uh, this success mm. and the reality in their own uh, uh, in their own work. And last one, I think Dorothy mentioned, um, uh, there are so many African languages, and still the colonial languages are used uh, for education. 
Africa is working um, that Af uh, that uh, through artificial intelligence translation into African languages, voice to voice translation can be possible. So we are seeing this and we're supporting this, for example, in Rwanda, um, uh, that Kenya Rwanda can be utilized as voice to voice uh, implementation mm. directly. Last one, I think also very concrete, uh, we saw that the COVID pandemic give really birth to new approaches. Um, facilitating the smart development hack with 1000 ideas, we saw really uh, how the ecosystem is responding and we, uh, we're seeing now how the implementing SMS based information systems, uh, we also seeing now how the implementing um, uh, uh, systems uh, to, uh, to allow uh, hospital beds uh, 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 registrations and we're also seeing uh, digital innovation now coming on board uh, for the COVAX uh, um, uh, campaign to facilitate better vaccination. So it's happening not tomorrow, it's happening now and we see that leapfrogging works already in the African soil and again Europe is a learner as well. It's not somebody that is giving something. I think we're on eye level here. That's absolutely new for international cooperation and I think we are in this together. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Bjorn, for uh, your reply. I think that it's true, it's an innovation, an innovative approach. And I think like there are a lot of challenges and education, as Dorothy was mentioning, is definitely one of them. Um, I have now a question for Onika. Onika, according to your uh, personal and professional experience, do African countries have the capacity mm -hmm. and the political willingness to work on digital transformation with an international actor such as the European Union? You're on mute. Uh, great, great question. Um, so I think uh, what, what's really greater here is the fact that there is a recognition of a need to connect even more people. I mean, we are at a point where uh, over 50% of the global, just a little over 50% of the global population is now online, whereas in Africa, uh, very few countries are even at that 50% mark. So there's a great um, understanding of the need and therefore the need to, to respond differently. However, I think one of the things that um, Dorothy brought up is the legacy relationship between Europe and Africa uh, is such that the, we probably have a little bit of a trust deficit, right? And therefore, there is a need to be very intentional in terms of how uh, that uh, partnership evolves, uh, but not just only intentional, but inclusive. Uh, and by that, I mean that, you know, we need to be looking at a more, more of a multi-stakeholder type approach where we are not leaving civil society behind because that trust deficit is not only between uh, the two continents, but it's also between citizens and governments uh, in both continents, uh, actually. So, uh, you know, and that contributes to the political will. The political will, really, I would like to challenge us to say, is the will of the people. Uh, you know, we are emerging democracies, some very old democracies, but there's really a need for us to understand that um, for a long time we've developed uh, digital, we've worked on digital development, leaving civil society behind while they were actually contributing quite tremendously towards this development. So the, the, the point where the partnership with Europe and Africa would come in would really be around looking at what Africa needs now in terms of investments for connectivity, but creating uh, and supporting the policy frameworks that would actually support this investment in a way that is centered around inclusivity, but also in a way that gives room for Africans to actually lead in their development, because we really need to change this um, legacy around uh, where you know Africa is just seen simply as the market for the next mobile technology or mobile or whatever technology, digital technology is out there, but begin to really recognize that there's innovation that happens in this region and, and give and partner in such a way that we give space for that innovation to also lead. So it truly is not, uh, it's, it's a combination of market driven, but also 
driven by the development needs um, of the region. And that's something that we really have not seen. And, and part of the reason why even the startup uh, ecosystem is challenged because it's really been around developing uh, for the next Uber of Africa, the next Zoom of Africa, the next What of Africa, where we have not really centered that innovation around Africa's needs and imagined that perhaps the next Amazon of Africa looks more like Makola Market in Ghana and less so like the Amazon uh, and the Walmart uh, development that we see. Uh, so the political will, I think, will come from the will of the people, uh, but also it will come from us giving space to actually listen to uh, what Africa needs and develop around Africa's needs, not around um, opening Africa's markets to Western goods. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anika. You touch uh, uh, so many different topics. It's certainly true that uh, um, creating a multilateral and multi-beneficial digital partnership between the EU and Africa is a challenge. And, uh, you know, there is also like this legacy that... Uh, uh, still prevents us to create maybe like an environment where we can trust uh, and exchange best practices uh, between each other. So my question for Bjorn is now, can be uh, the D4D hub the right place to create this genuine partnership between African and European countries with a mutual exchange of best practices, lesson learned, especially if we take into consideration that uh, different uh, member states have different interests? Uh, when it comes to digital cooperation with Africa? Yeah, thanks um, for, for the question. Look, I, th I, I think it's difficult to answer. I, I would rather suggest we try it out yeah? um, because um, we're working um, in an area, digital transformation is very disruptive. There are new approaches needed. Um, and uh, we all know, um, for example, how M-Pesa um, uh, implemented leapfrogging from no bank account to digital bank account. So, um, I would say uh, if you talk to digital uh, transformation experts, nobody can really predict what is happening in the next five years. What is very predictable is that um, digital transformation needs new uh, partnerships, like what my colleagues laid out, um, that we need to work with civil society, we need to work with tech companies, uh, we need to work with the partner countries, and uh, obviously also with innovative actors like the, uh, the startup world. So what I would uh, would suggest this as long as um, the governments uh, that are supporting the D4D hub um, uh, coming from 11 member states of, of the EU and um, the European Commission, as long as they are able to allow new innovative uh, approaches like design thinking, like Scrum for project development, like also bringing um, uh, people on uh, uh, from civil society and tech companies on eye level um, to this uh, cooperation, I think it, it has a very good chance to, uh, to bear fruits uh, um, uh, what uh, I believe is also important is that the European Union should not be shy, but actually um, share its experiences on the GDPR, on the data um, uh, security, uh, and its ex experiences how to implement that um, on artificial intelligence, on the data package that was just released, and also on the data sharing agreements between business to business and business to government uh, agreements, because they are really leading the world in a certain uh, way. Now, I. I honestly believe we are still far from understanding how this actually unfolds into our society and what does that make with our regulations and what does it make with our own digital sovereignty. So that's why I would emphasize uh, if the D4D hub is a, uh, is a space uh, that is creating on eye level, uh, if the African partners uh, with the whole ecosystem approach entering into cooperation and saying we would like to have the support of the European Union and its member states um, for our digital sovereignty for our data markets uh, to build up our own digital economy um, and at the, at the same time the European Union uh, is very clear with its member states we would like, would like to also learn um, from approaches on uh, African soil I think then uh, the D4D hub can be the right uh, uh, system but um, the bottom line is this is an innovative approach and it needs to be um, led um, by very clear and bold um, decision makers that give space for digital innovations and at the same time have a very bold investment understanding a on the political level and b obviously on the financial level we see this is happening uh, but the speed is not enough we should be faster and that's why i would i would emphasize and saying um, the more um, uh, colleagues are working with the d4d hub as an initiative the more it actually will uh, allow what you just requested for that this should be the right place uh, to facilitate partnerships 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Bjorn. I think like uh, uh, ambition is the key uh, word that uh, we can take out from what you just say. And uh, for sure, there are like some areas, regulatory framework, GDPR, in which the EU can effectively cooperate with uh, African countries. At the same time, I think uh, Onika was mentioning uh, connectivity and uh, digital infrastructure investment as a priority. So I have a question now for Dorothy. What are the areas, according to your opinion, that should be the priority for the cooperation between the EU and African partners? Also, if we consider that there are different geopolitical interests and other actors that uh, are massively cooperating with Africa in the field of digital. Uh, that is an excellent question, and I'm glad you mentioned the other partners, because it's very important that we keep that in mind, that we have a context uh, which is not exclusive, that there are many players here. Um, but, you know, going back to Onika, at a very high level, the African Union has clearly given its support to this partnership between Africa and Europe. So we have that high level commitment, but as Onika mentioned, whether or not anybody, the average person in Africa walking along the street, the civil society organizations, whether they are aware of the partnership even is a big issue. Now you were asking about uh, the priorities. There is one, there are two, let me give two major priorities for Africa. One of them is jobs. You know that we are going to have about 375 million young people hitting our job markets in 2030, what is known as the youth bulge. And the second is that many jobs are being taken away from our people and our most vulnerable people because of climate change. So we look at those two and um, then we have other geopolitical imperatives such as the, the nature of conflict, the situation that the US left for us in Libya, which is allowing um, insecurity within the entire West African region. And of course we have lots of um, conflicts throughout the region as well, but priorities, Rather than, um, and then also let me mention that we have a very heterogeneous uh, continent. And what we have seen is in the past, partners, development partners, or as they were previously known, donors, tend to focus on those markets where they think they will be able to um, satisfy their own interests in terms of selling goods. However, and that means that the most vulnerable countries, the LDCs, they have not received enough attention. And because they have not received enough attention, um, they are far behind. So we have a very unequal development when it comes to digital in Africa. Um, and that unequal development is not just in terms of country differences between countries, but it also affects the differences between sexes. So you see that African women are not participating fully in this digital transformation. So that for me is definitely a priority. The other thing which is a big priority and makes it look completely worthless to discuss this is we do have an energy crisis. And if we don't address the energy crisis, there's no way that we are going to successfully take the internet, for example, to our most rural areas. So these are a few of the things that we must address that I would see that the EU partnership has to address these things head on. Um, definitely, I hope that they will not leave any women behind. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dorothy. I think you touch two uh, very crucial aspects of the cooperation between the EU and uh, African countries. Um, so I have now questions for Onika. Um, so Dorothy was, actually I have two questions for Onika because uh, uh, Bjorn was mentioning like the cooperation in terms of uh, uh, framework for uh, um, government, B2P, 
etc., such as the GDPR. So how can we ensure that cooperation in these fields can be both demand-driven and effective for people, government and business, meaning all the actors involved in digitalization? And also like another question that uh, uh, was uh, raised on the topic that uh, uh, Dorothy just, just raised. So how can we make also this cooperation inclusive and how can we see uh, this cooperation in uh, a way that it's effectively supporting uh, inclusiveness of women in digital cooperation? Great. Um, you know, in terms of um, making sure that we are moving more towards demand-driven uh, development, it's really important that we, we do consultations that include civil society, private sector, as well as government uh, in, in all of our recommendations. In fact, the Alliance for Affordable Internet has, has actually uh, adopted some good practices around policy frameworks, for example, uh, to increase affordability. And we continue to work on uh, looking at meaningful uh, access and connectivity uh, for people. So it's really critical that we, we don't continue to leave civil society behind in these conversations and actually center them, uh, quite frankly, uh, in this development. In, in order to make sure that uh, our digital development is inclusive, it has to center women. I mean, it was in 1985, I believe, when uh, women met in Nairobi and came out with a very bold declaration and demonstration that women literally carry the world. And just a week ago, Oxfam issued a report on the inequality virus that actually shows that during COVID one year, women lost $800 billion in income uh, in the economy. Uh, so it's no doubt, especially in Africa, that women are the drivers of the economy. So we can't really be talking about developing our digital uh, world as well as digital economies when we have not centered women uh, in that. And that then means that not only do we have to focus on uh, policy frameworks around deploying the infrastructure where the women are, in rural areas included, because that's another big growing divide is the urban and rural uh, uh, divide. But also that we are focusing on some of the demand side issues for this connectivity. And, 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 and key for me, uh, especially when it comes to women, is digital skills, uh, making sure that we are, we are investing in infrastructure frameworks as well as in developing the digital skills uh, so for, for utilization of this uh, connectivity, uh, as well as local content. Um, I think we are coming to a, a, a point where we need to be very careful of how we have allowed digital to develop in an English only uh, uh, state and that in order for us to truly say we are bringing everyone along, we must develop digital content uh, that is actually relevant to uh, people in the countries where uh, we are developing it for and simply translating information that's originally written in English for English context to a local language is not the kind of dynamic uh, digital content environment that we are hoping for, um, you know. So, so for me, that inclusivity requires being able to incentivize even these investments so that we begin to measure this. It, it baffles me how for so many years, we've had all these wonderful policies about gender equality, about making sure we don't leave anyone behind, but somehow we have failed to create the monitoring systems that actually ensures that these are, are fully implemented, right? I'm sure every country has a, a law or policy that speaks to, to pay equity, for example, yet we still have in, in, in inequality in, 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 in income, so in, in, in salaries. So I think for me, in terms of this partnership, where it would go to an, a higher level would be to actually create incentives and consequences. You know, there needs to be consequence management in a relationship where partners promise to deliver certain things and fail to do so per the agreement. Otherwise, these become sort of, you know, the agreements that nations sign, but, you know, we come to expect not much of it. So, so my, my hope really is that uh, women are centered 
in all the policies that are uh, 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 incentivized uh, through the program and that, uh, you know, they are seen as the oxygen for driving digital uh, economies, uh, especially in Africa. So thank you very much, Onika. I have uh, maybe a follow up for uh, Dorothy. Considering what uh, Onika just said, do you believe that the current EU Digital Africa strategy will impact positively on vulnerable people if we consider that there should be like many priorities, including education and digital skills? And if so, how? Well, I think that Bjorn said it all. He said that this is something which is in its nascent state. We are at the beginning. It will be very difficult for us to assess now how much impact it will have on vulnerable people. But when I was thinking about this issue, I realized that we have a multiplicity of EU programs that need to uh, synergize. For example, you have the program on, I think it's a task force for rural Africa, which focuses on food and farming. And then you have um, the new Africa Sustainable Inven Investment and Jobs, I think, uh, program. So there are possibilities there in terms of synergy with other programs. But what we've seen so far when it comes to digital is there's a tendency to focus on the people in the larger cities where it's easier to have well-educated people who speak English or French or Portuguese, uh, whichever colonial language. And we, we tend to neglect the rest. And then we are totally unrealistic when we think about schools. You see people saying, oh, we are developing great digital content for African schools, or we are localizing content. And meanwhile, the vast majority of these schools, even in urban areas, do not have access to electricity at all, let alone bandwidth. And we know that mobile internet is not the best for teaching and learning. So I believe, frankly, that uh, Africa-EU partnership, it, is, it has to be a partnership. And the African Union itself and its member states have to look very deep down to see how they can make this digital transformation work for the bulk of their population. This is something that we have to do together. And we have to ask Europe, because there are vulnerable people in Europe. How did you reach out effectively to the vulnerable people in Europe? There are people who cannot read in Europe. There are people who come with different languages into different contexts. How was this done? So I think that the spirit of the partnership is going to be um, with mutual learning and a lot of humility, because as Bjorn said, much of this has never been done before. It's got to be very innovative. I've worked all my career with the vulnerable and I've been horrified at some of the costs we have imposed upon them with our experimentation. So let's have a listening ear and really understand what their needs are before taking up their precious time and energy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Maybe I have like a, a very quick comment because we are running out of time and maybe like a, a question to, to Bjorn. Um, so we are seeing that, you know, there are different ways to promote uh, uh, cooperation with Africa. But uh, how would we ensure that the digital cooperation through development and through cooperation in the digital sphere doesn't look like a sort of neocolonialism, according to your opinion? <clears throat> yes, thanks. Maybe to be very, very sharp on this one. Uh, from what we see is that for digital development, the good old development cooperation, we send money somewhere and um, help ourselves uh, and help somewhere has ended. Uh, uh, like Dorothy laid out, we have a totally new system of cooperation here, which is uh, has a enormous potential. Yeah, we see this um, with the camp if the, if the campaigns on eSkills for Girls, where um, the support to digital skills for young females in the ICT sectors has been developed in the last couple of years. We see this also um, in, 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 the, in the startup system. Um, and we, we definitely see also that there are new unicorns uh, being developed in Egypt and other countries. Fantastic. 
But I also would like to uh, say uh, digital has two coins. There are a lot of challenges. Uh, the internet access in Africa is widening uh, as we speak. It's not closing, it's widening uh, because of the population growth. Their drones and social scoring systems are being used uh, for surveillance um, and are being uh, utilized uh, um, against human rights uh, defenders. Uh, and uh, data markets are exploited by foreign companies. Um, uh, and the data value creation, yeah, the, 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 the data economy um, the value creation is being uh, utilized for the um, for for, uh, for 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 the benefit in other countries. So I just wanted to say there are also challenges, and and in this I think we are in the, together, Europe and Africa. So. Um, what I, uh, what I believe is the offer of the of the D4D hub um, and also the activities on digital development is um, uh, is a value based approach to really work on digital sovereignty. Now, how this looks um, uh, for, can be uh, seen at the EU AO data flagship that was launched between the African Union and the European Union also in December. Um, where uh, we are working together with uh, with regulatory authorities of 30 countries to precisely do what uh, uh, what my colleagues uh, 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 in the panel all, already laid out. We would like to support the creation of African-owned data markets and its value creation for the people. Now that's hasn't been done so far, uh, even in Europe, in, in a lot of areas. Also, the, uh, the European digital market is only two or three years old, uh, however you want to call that. And I think it's it's uh, it's time to do that, but it's also time to understand this is a huge challenge that needs bold um, uh, leadership. And last one, how that uh, effort uh, doesn't look like neocolonialism. Um, uh, or uh, uh, um, oppression even. Um, I believe uh, following the digital principles for donor cooperation that DIAL, the International Organization of uh, Digital uh, the Donor Coordination has been set up and uh, uh, has been endorsed by more than 200 organizations from uh, development agencies, from companies, from entrepreneurs and from civil society would build a very clear and good framework. And there you see the support of the ecosystem. There you see also things like open source and reusable uh, ideas, and I believe that is not a European, that is a, a worldwide owned uh, uh, principles, and we should follow uh, these principles in order to make sure it's really for the benefit of the people on both continents. I have to say, this one is new on both continents. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Um, I have then a very last quick question to, to Susanna. Susanna, what are the final messages that we can uh, bring out from this uh, panel today? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, I have to say it's very difficult to summarize, but there are a few messages that uh, that came out very clearly, and that uh, this digital partnership between Africa and EU is a new way how to overcome the, uh, the legacy relationship, and also not to create a new dependency between the two continents. It's it's the way for the new gene partnership where both sides on all the stakeholders on both sides can actually uh, benefit from working together and uh, to bring the human centric uh, development not only to the to the people in the cities but uh, to all uh, people in uh, in every part of Europe and of Africa and we have to localize, not only in terms of um, um, uh, the local needs, but also the local languages. And uh, one message which was uh, really nicely said uh, is that women are actually oxygen for driving digital transformation. Well, Thank you very much, Susanna. I think that uh, uh, like these are really the, the key areas for uh, cooperation. And it's crucial that, uh, uh, for instance, men and women benefit the same from uh, digital transformation. Um, I see that uh, like we have a timer that is ticking here on the screen. So I wanted to thank you all the speakers of this panel, Bjorn Richter from uh, GIZ, Onika Makwakwa, uh, Dorothy Gordon, and Susanna Zlatkova for being with us. Um, well, thank you also like to the people who attended our Fringe event. Um, I would like to uh, encourage to follow more the program of the State of the Union. Uh, please stay tuned for the next panel. 
thank you for being with us and of course like uh, keep in touch with us with the uh, with the speakers or with the European Digital Development Alliance to further discuss the topic of EU cooperation with African countries. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the program of the State of the Union.